with ribocyclib having a broader inclusion criteria. Okay, so can we start here with ribo? The approved starting dose is 400 milligrams in adjuvant settings and 600 milligrams in metastatic settings. With ribocyclib, we have to be careful with QTC, so we monitor EKGs. LFT, we have to be very careful with monitoring that. But we still have to keep neutropenia on our radar, as that is more of a class effect with CDK4-6 inhibitors. Stephanie, when you're talking through these options with your patients, and when it comes to ribocyclib, what should be on our radar and any clinical pearls on how to manage these? Yeah, so when I talk to a patient about ribocyclib versus abemocyclib in the adjuvant setting, first, I talk to patients about them early. I mentioned that this is probably going to be a part of a patient's treatment plan at our first consultation, often before surgery, because I know that the patient has a larger tumor, is node positive, has a high grade tumor, has that profile with a little bit lower ER, a little bit lower PR that makes me think that their oncotype is going to come back sky high. I'll mention, I think that you're probably going to end up on this other pill as well, because I think that so often patients with hormone receptor positive disease think that they have good breast cancer. For anyone listening on the podcast, I'm using air quotes around the word good because I hate that. And So that I think helps patients kind of prepare that this is coming. And then in terms of choosing between ribociclib and abemociclib, I go by the trials. There's a slightly wider group of patients that are eligible for ribociclib than abemociclib. I try not to color outside of the lines and give abemociclib to those lower risk patients. I engage the patient in shared decision-making. I have the, I have patients who don't want to take ribociclib because they don't want a risk of liver toxicity. I have patients who had terrible diarrhea with their chemotherapy, and the idea of that being a side effect with abema is quite concerning for them. Alternatively, they have chronic constipation, and they're like, give me the abema. And so it, it goes sort of every which way. We do have a press release that tells us that abema cyclib is going to be showing us overall survival data in uh, no time at all here at the upcoming ESMO meeting and we'll watch to see the impact of that data and how it influences these conversations. We're also going to be getting longer term follow up on Natalie ribociclib. But I think that what we've seen is that those curves for Natalie, although that trial accrued at a later time point, has separated at a similar pace and rate as the Abema data. You know, we can't really do cross-trial comparison. There was a lower risk population of patients. So is the impact a little bit smaller? Yes, but that's probably representative of the patient populations. I think ultimately I feel very comfortable with both drugs and it really just comes down to what group of side effects that patient wants to feel. Thanks for unpacking that, uh, Stephanie. With regards to ribociclib, QTC being something that we have to worry about, do you do EKG at baseline and then two weeks and then start of cycle two and then forego after that? Yeah, so when Natalie was released and the package insert got updated, regulators dropped that two-week EKG from the package insert. Now the recommendation is a baseline EKG and then EKG in a month. I typically just do two EKGs. I do a careful review of their meds because I think the biggest predictor is drug interactions. And I tell patients I'm prescribing ribociclib that QT prolongation is a side effect. And the biggest predictor of that is them taking something that causes QT prolongation. Even some holistic therapies can do that. Things like grapefruit juice and St. John's wort. I encourage them that anytime they start a new medicine, they need to call and let me know so that we can watch. When we're managing things like nausea, we need to be thoughtful about what nausea medicine. If we have to reach for things like Andansetron to manage Zofran, we have to go back to checking EKGs because it can prolong QT interval. Stephanie, talking about that, 600 milligrams is what we have for metastatic settings and 400 milligrams in adjuvant settings. Is the QTC dose dependent? And what about the LFTs? Yeah, we certainly saw a lower rate of QT prolongation in Natalie, which leads you to think that the QT may be dose dependent. 
Um, I think that the incidence of QT prolongation was so low 